What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Though the other day, Nintendo hit a pretty big milestone, one that is equally impressive as it is sad, especially when it comes to new hardware from Nintendo, which we'll go over that here today. Also, we are be talking about another blow to physical media as we have an end of an era when it comes to rentals from specifically kiosks. And then we'll also be going over Sony's big live service game that's going to have a weekend here with Concord as it looks like they're opening it up to even more people. So if you guys enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And of course, members of the channels do get Newswave early. If you'd like to learn more about that, click the join button down below this video. And we're going to start today with an update for Nintendo Switch Online as Nintendo did announce more games going into specifically the Game Boy Advance application. We can see this posted up over on their official account where they say three classic games featuring Starfy, the Prince of Puff Top, are now available to play for Nintendo Switch Online Plus expansion members. Of course, you will need the, the $50 per year tier for this since these are Game Boy Advance games. We have Densetsu no Starfy 1, 2, and 3. And uh, you're seeing this right. They... They are all still in Japanese. Like, Nintendo didn't actually localize or translate these. They are just outright dropping the, really, the, the Japanese ROM onto all the different GBA applications across the world. Kind of unfortunate there, obviously, because, well, if you really want to get into the Starfy lore, it's going to be very difficult unless you can read just Japanese text. Uh, in this case, though, it is a platformer, so it's... It's not crucial to understand everything that's on screen technically, especially when it comes to, I guess, the story. If this was a text-heavy RPG, i just say, all right, good luck with that. But Starfy, I remember from, like, the DS days. I, I know there were Game Boy Advance games floating around in Japan for this one, but I, I never had a chance to play them. I guess here, tactically, it'll just be available in the Nintendo Switch Online app to check out. But yeah, unfortunate that Nintendo didn't think to localize or really do anything when it comes to translating this to anything other than just Japanese, as I feel like that's a pretty big missed opportunity to have something just completely unique for the service. Also, we did have an announcement for a release date of another Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, which we can see the trailer for it here. And this is for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutants Unleashed. Now, this game is coming out October 18th, and they did show off some, some gameplay for this one, and... Alright, so it's from Outright Games. They would typically do things like the like PJ Masks and other games that are geared more towards a, a younger audience through, like, obviously the, the, the IP itself, but also the gameplay and stuff. It, these aren't games that you would compare to big AAA titles. This one, for example, is a $40 game. And it, I mean, it's coming out on a bunch of different systems. We have it on PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo Switch. It'll also be going to Steam. And as I'm looking at this, it does just look like one of those lower tier, mid tier style games. But I think it could be a lot of fun for TMNT fans, especially if you are if you maybe have a, kids that would also like to play. This seems like a game kind of right up that alley, sort of. So I, I'm looking more towards, like, Splintered Fate. And then, of course, the last Ronin that should, I assume, be more on that AAA level as an action RPG. But it does seem like we're just getting a lot of Ninja Turtles games right now, and I'm not really going to complain about that. Oh, and we did have pre-orders go live for that Nintendo Switch Lite Zelda edition. Here's a few pictures of it over on Best Buy currently. I mean, it's set up at $210. It also says it comes with the Nintendo Switch Online Plus expansion pack. So I, I guess you'll just get a voucher to have that for, it looks like on the front of the box says 12 months. He's going to a year's worth of that alongside it. That's not a bad deal. And as I'm looking around the Switch Lite, it does look good. I, I figure this is going to be one that most people are going to pick up as a collector's piece. Uh, it, it, on the back, it has the, obviously, the we have a crest there the, for Zelda there on the back of the system. And then they have the Switch Lite logo kind of off to the left side a bit to make room for it. Uh, again, this is one that I think people will probably buy, most likely keep in the box, but it's also going to just drive Switch Lite sales in general since it'll be around when the new Zelda game also comes out this holiday. All this, of course, working towards, we assume, Nintendo making that final push for the Switch to eventually pass the PS2. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with the Nintendo Switch hitting a pretty big milestone. Just overall, for all the different home console generations, this is now the longest Nintendo has gone from the start of a generation to when the next generation begins with the new system being introduced and then released. 
The last one was actually the Famicom to the Super Famicom. We can see this though posted up over on VGC, who actually had the story and ran the numbers and they even have a nice little chart to kind of show this. But they say, since its worldwide launch on March 3rd, 2017, 2,687 days have passed without the arrival of a successor console, meaning Switch's lifespan has officially beaten Nintendo's previous longest lasting console, the Famicom at 2,686 days. It's also very important to note that we still don't have the announcement of the next system. So this number is just gonna to continue to climb. Like I, I assume this is something that we'll still be talking about in 2025, waiting for the next system to come out because I'm not expecting Nintendo to get their new system out by the end of this year for the holiday. We, we'd probably know about the system by now if that was the strategy currently. So there is a chance that they could run this thing up near 3000 days for this home console generation for Nintendo, before the next system comes out. Now, I guess you could say, well, it's it's also falls in line with handhelds and it's it's gonna be nowhere near the Game Boy. That was over 4,350 days between that and the Game Boy Advance. I know there are people who discuss the Game Boy Color as being a new generation, but Nintendo seems to just show as Game Boy to then Game Boy Advance. We also have the full chart here that again, VGC made up and I, it is interesting to look through this and just sort of see the number of days for generations with the, I, the, the GameCube was 1,892, which wasn't great in terms of length for the console. But then you look at the Wii U and it was 1,566 days. I mean, Nintendo was, they were ready to get out of the, the Wii U generation as soon as possible, which I mean, obviously they had the Switch cooking up in the background and that's shown to be a tremendous success for them. So that one worked out for them in the long run. But uh, it's just, it's interesting to see the Switch in particular have this long of a generation because there isn't a secondary system. So in the past, yes, you would have a home console from Nintendo, we'll say like the, the Wii, but you'd also have the DS running alongside of it and they would almost be staggered at times for different generations launching. So every few years, you would have some sort of new hardware generation launching from Nintendo, whether it was like, okay, here comes the 3DS, okay, here comes the Wii U, or even before that, as we mentioned with the Game Boy Advance launching around the time of the GameCube, there was just, there were different avenues to have new pieces of hardware launching as opposed to now, where it's just the Switch. Sure, you get an OLED model, and that's great, a Switch Lite, but to go from one generation to have a generational leap in terms of capabilities, power, functionality, fun little wrinkles in there, you're just waiting for one new generation to start, not two. So it, it is nice to have everything in terms of software development focusing in on the Switch. But then on the other side, you can see how there's kind of a drawback when you don't have as many hardware generations launching um, alongside of each other within Nintendo. So uh, interesting stuff nonetheless to see how long it's actually been between generations right now for Nintendo. And it's still gonna be a while. Like I said, they might get this thing closer to 3000 days before they're ready to launch their next generation Switch system. Next up, let's talk about another blow to physical media, which seems to be something that's being talked about more and more now, obviously, as we've mentioned before with digital games being on the rise over the last decade or so. It's not surprising to see that things like Redbox, might be struggling to the point where it's just outright going away. We can see this is posted up by Variety, um, where they say Redbox's network of 24,000 DVD rental kiosks and its streaming services will be shut down after its parent company, Chicken Soup for the Soul Entertainment. Oh, that's the, I didn't realize that was the, <laughs> interesting, okay. Converted its Chapter 11 bankruptcy case to a Chapter 7 liquidation proceeding on Wednesday. That is, those are a lot of kiosks that just go away, 24,000. Now, they shifted to chapter seven liquidation because they really don't have a strategy to come back from this. It, like there's no way they're gonna be able to pay down their debts or restructure and figure this thing out. Typically, if you're a company that's gonna go through bankruptcy, maybe you can slash expenses or figure out ways to try to increase profitability. Uh, for the future right now of physical DVDs and Blu-rays. It's just, this doesn't seem to be a strong path forward with the way specifically streaming services are going and just kind of taking over that entire sector. Blockbuster went away. It was a little easier for Redbox to stick around because these were kiosks and not 
large stores that you had to, of course, pay massive amounts of rent on before you even take any money in for the month. So here with Redbox going away, you then lose a pretty sizable vendor for physical media. That, that's the biggest thing there. While they did stop doing game rentals in 2019, probably because the cost was just incredible. If you think about, okay, 60 or even $70 games for, or $70 games per rental, as opposed to DVDs and the Blu-rays that can be a bit cheaper, especially as they're recycled over and over again, you find them in like $5 bins. Uh, it just got to a point, I'm sure, when it came to the amount of money they were losing from games coming back scratched, or not at all, they decided to kind of move away from, from that. And then also, of course, we see where games are going right now with digital really taking over, even when it comes to fixes for the games with updates or you rent Call of Duty and you actually have to download the entirety of the game. So it's uh, unfortunate really for people who obviously got a kick out of going to Redbox and just be able to pick up a spur of the moment movie for the weekend. That's basically gone. Like it's gone to the point where it's, it's happening right now. They were aren't able to pay their employees. So like the judge ruled that, yeah, that's it. You're just shutting down and no one's coming to work at Redbox anymore. So if you see a Redbox machine around now, it'll probably be gone in like a week or two at this point as they move to liquidate basically everything. Next up, let's talk about Sony's multiplayer live service game that is releasing in August. And that is Concord, which has pretty much been the internet's punching bag since it was fully shown off for the first time with cinematics and gameplay. It hasn't gone over well where people are looking at it as like the... the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy stunt doubles, right? That that whole joke or the idea that it's uh, the Overwatch. I you know we have Overwatch at home. Well, we do have a beta coming up this weekend. The only issue has been you have to pre-order the game to then get access to this beta. Now, if you know someone who pre-ordered it, they also gave out passes to them so they could throw you a code and then you can jump on board. But now it looks like Sony has decided that if you just have PlayStation Plus, you're in. So we can see this post up on their official account where they say everything you need to play Concord for the upcoming beta weekends, early access to the beta for all PlayStation Plus members. They do have the preload and go live times as well as PC requirements. So they have the weekend actually starting today, July 12th through the 14th. And then next weekend, they will have just a full open beta weekend, which is odd to me because to my understanding, you would need PlayStation Plus to play this game online. It is a paid game. I guess for the open beta weekend, maybe they'll just open it up for just free access. Even if you don't have PlayStation Plus, you can just jump on and try it out as they would want to stress the servers as much as possible on their end, just to make sure they're ready to go for when the game launches in August. Here's the thing about this though. The fact that they're opening it up now to PlayStation Plus and pivoting a bit from, you have to pre-order the game, tells me and I'm sure many others that pre-orders just are not high for this thing and it's, is it shocking to hear that, that people aren't rushing out to just buy Concord to get into a, uh, a, a beta for a weekend? No, not shocking at all. So I, uh, I have a lot of questions around Concord and I guess the good thing here is I can try it out this weekend and you know what? I will be doing that. I will fire up the game probably tomorrow or no, probably I'll do it today on Friday, Friday night, try out the game, see how it goes. And I will give it a fair shot. I know there's people who are probably just going to be dunking on it immediately before they even go in. They, they have been, but like when they really get in there, it's just be like, okay, a couple games and I'm out. I will give this one a serious try both weekends and then report back, give some of my thoughts on it. But uh, it has not been great so far for this game from Firewalk and Maybe it maybe it's really, really good in terms of the gameplay and it could turn everything around, but at this point, I'm not really holding my breath for that. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Microsoft and some of their strange marking that people have been picking up on, specifically when it comes to the Xbox console itself, as Microsoft has been pretty quick to say, you don't need a console to play our games. This was something that was really obvious when they were talking about the Amazon Fire TV stick, where they said, no console required. You can just use your Amazon Fire TV and start streaming Xbox games. Just make sure you have a controller of some kind. It doesn't even have to be an Xbox controller. You can use a, you can use a PlayStation DualSense or a DualShock controller if you have that just laying around. Well, we can see this posted up. This is over on Pure Xbox, and they are quoting Tom Warren, as he does have like a write-up over on uh, The Verge, like his notepad 
write up and in this he talks about a tip that he received back in May around Microsoft's upcoming marketing strategy saying I received a tip that Microsoft is changing up its Xbox strategy for the new financial year in regions like Europe Africa Middle East I haven't been able to fully verify this but the tipster claimed Microsoft will stop marketing Xbox consoles in certain markets in EMEA and focus only on Game Pass cloud gaming PC and Xbox controller. So this would be in, in like Europe and parts around there. And this isn't, this isn't too surprising if this ends up being correct from this, this tip that Tom Warren received, because we're already seeing Microsoft sort of do that just in general, like globally, Hey, you don't need an Xbox system to play our games through game pass and cloud streaming. Clearly they're trying to push people towards the $20 per month, like game pass ultimate tier as that is the one that has the day one releases whereas clouds or console standard will not have that at $15 per month. But in Europe, it seems like sales have not been great for the Xbox console and Microsoft. Well, they're the ones who would know that with the numbers, I'm sure coming back to them, obviously. And they're looking at the spreadsheets and going, okay, maybe we can make a pivot to, you don't need an Xbox console. They're not selling right now. Anyway, there let's see if we can get people on board for the idea of cloud gaming. And I feel like cloud gaming in general has not picked up the kind of steam that Microsoft was hoping for. Even Sony, like Sony has a pretty good streaming service right now for PlayStation 5. And I just don't really ever hear anyone talking about it necessarily. And with Microsoft and Xbox, while people will use cloud streaming, like RGT, for example, will at times when we're looking around for multiplayer games, just stream it rather than download it to see if it's something he'll rage quit in the first match and then never try it again. It saves him some time, at least from downloading the game. But for this to work, I feel like for Microsoft with this kind of strategy, they would need cloud gaming adoption to accelerate rapidly. Now, we don't really know what their next generation is going to look like at this time, but there has been a lot of discussion around AI and maybe that somehow pairs better with cloud gaming to make it a better experience overall. It's possible. But uh, this to me sounds like, again, from a tip currently going off of The Verge, that it might just be Microsoft pivoting because they see the console sales at this time in Europe. But we also see the console sales declining in general for Microsoft across the world, and even tracking behind something like the Xbox One that was not a great generation even for Microsoft. It seemed like that entire time they were just playing catch up and they're behind that. So that's, this is something to keep an eye on here specifically for their marketing and see how much more they wanna tell people that you don't need a console to play their games. And before we go to the comments of the day, we'll take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday. We're asked, if you have a Switch, how old is the current one you're using? Wow, 56%, it's five plus years old. That's uh. That's pretty impressive that there are most likely, I think a bunch of launch switches out there still rolling along fine, but then you have like less than one year, two years. I'm picturing some OLED switches really uh, in that time period, then three and four years, but they yeah, had a lot of people just five years plus. And I do wonder how many people have just always had it in the dock. Like it's just been a console for them at all times. They never use it handheld style. I, I do know some who have mentioned that, but it just seems interesting to me that people just look at the system as a full on console, never take advantage of that hybrid nature. But it just goes to show five plus years with the Switch now, coming up maybe on 3000 days before the next system comes out. It's uh, It's been quite the lengthy generation for Nintendo as they've gotten a lot out of the system. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Anom Anonymous, who says, uh, the spookiest thing was that there was no funny announcer voice advertising a new Emio game that we should please look forward to. You know, it's funny. I, I thought a bit more about that Emio trailer and how Nintendo should go about advertising and marketing this thing. I guess it does depend on when it comes out. Like if this is a trailer that they're showing now because it's out before the end of the year. They won't have much of a chance to really try to run some kind of mystery campaign because my thought here is this is at multiple directs, even like smaller directs as well, indie showcases, uh, different things you can do just to kind of make it seem like something is off a bit. So for example, this 15 second trailer would be awesome to have something similar, maybe a little shorter. And it just kind of cuts in to a direct with no explanation, no title, and it's something along this line where it's very mysterious, maybe a, just a person or something going on there with the paper bag stuff. And then it cuts back out and the direct just keeps going like normal and no one mentions anything. That would be a very interesting marketing campaign for Nintendo to run 
But the more they do that, the more they allude to this game, the higher the expectations are going to be. And to me, the, the better the payoff has to inevitably be. So that's that's a big thing to keep in mind there. How far do they want to push this? And what kind of a game do they actually have behind this whole who is Emio thing? And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything. We talked about here today was Nintendo Switch now becoming the longest running generation for Nintendo, beating out even the Famicom. And then also, what about Concord opening up completely now to PlayStation Plus members and Redbox just completely liquidating and going away? Is that a service or kiosk that you've used in the past or even just recently? Thanks guys for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here Monday morning, 8 Eastern time for Newswave.